Mike, before the break, we were asking you, hey, you know, these are all great solutions and ideas, but government can't really regulate it, and we don't trust the big tech companies to regulate it. So what exactly is the solution here? And it turns out your team actually has some ideas it's been talking to our national leaders about. Can you share with us what that idea is? Yeah. Well, just as a quick intro, it is very clear the government has its own agenda. The political party in power has its own preferred narrative on most of the big topics of the day. And I love your characterization of having our political partisan government be the regulator of online content is exactly the fox guarding the hen house and uh, introduces irresistible problems to muzzle the government's political opponents and, and people who elect the power or the resources. And by the way, our Supreme Court has clearly stated multiple times, you know, that falsehoods and information that goes against the government narrative is absolutely considered pr protected free speech and the mm -hmm. government can't block that. And the reason is the Supreme Court has clearly said they understand, yes, sometimes falsehoods are harmful, but it's far, far more harmful for the government to try to decide for us what is true and what is false. I mean, this is effectively North Korea. It's what puts us on the road to authoritarian government. And we've already seen evidence of that from the Twitter files investigation where people from the White House and government agencies specifically identified not only misinformation and disinformation, but also in their emails that became public, they specifically called something malinformation, which they knew was true, but they still asked these platforms to block it or censor it because it was just inconvenient for their narrative, particularly regarding COVID policies. So outside of government, We've explored quite a bit how other industries solve this type of issue. And being in venture capital, one model that I found is an organization called FINRA, which stands for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. It's a non-government entity. They certify and approve financial advisors, stockbrokers, companies that provide these services, wealth planners, and they provide, very importantly, an independent mechanism to arbitrate disputes uh, between millions of investors and these financial advisors or these financial companies. And FINRA has access to 8,000 arbitration judges who are basically retired judges and, and lawyers who do this part-time for FINRA. All their arbitrations are conducted online using Skype or Zoom type calls to reduce time and cost. There's no travel involved. And uh, clearly these judges are very capable of assessing whether harm uh, occurred, you know, for an investor and, and whether the wealth advisors, you know, followed the rules and the principles that they're supposed to follow. FINRA is not funded by the government. It's funded by the industry using a very simple mathematical formula. And FINRA does have real teeth. They have fined companies millions of dollars. They've actually banned many uh, dozens, I should say, of advisors and employees of these companies from the industry or suspended them from a, a year. The government has no role whatsoever in appointing the leadership of FINRA, hiring or firing anyone. They don't get to approve their budget, uh, et cetera. They are independent uh, of the government. So we have developed a proposal, which we've been test driving with the companies in the industry, um, with the FCC and with Congress, an entity very similar to FINRA, which we call AMRA, which is Online Media Regulatory Authority, and it would operate in a similar way. It would certify these large platforms, uh, particularly for having transparency and publishing all their content rules and ensuring that those rules fit within the four guardrails. And then AMRA would be able to provide an independent entity, non-government, a place to go to handle appeals of the disputes that will inevitably come up between users and these industry platform companies uh, and it could be financed funded by the industry you know the top five companies in this industry generate over 500 billion dollars in annual revenue so cost isn't really a fundamental issue for you know setting up omra interesting you know this idea makes me think of 1984, the book that a lot of us 
read in, <laughs> read in high school, yes. George Orwell's 1984, Orwell's 1984, and where, you know, you have big tech and big brother trying to basically determine what is true for everybody. And Amra comes in and says, ha, 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 no, that's not going to happen. The yeah. people get to decide what the truth is for themselves. Um, Make Orwell fiction again. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> so um, if you could just very briefly give us a sense of what, how, how would you get these companies to submit themselves to Amra's regulatory mm -hmm. authority to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. And um, give us a, maybe a practical example of how it would work if you could give you know, a couple of minutes um, on that. Would be well, great. Let, me, let me take the second one first. Okay. And then go to how do we get the companies to participate in this, which leads into uh, what kind of government mandate or change to Section 230, you know, would would uh, would cause that. But an example of how AMRA might work, let's say a user, um, it might be a business, it might be a news media site, or it might be, you know, your podcast, um, or, or even an individual person, a citizen who has some content blocked. Uh, or they notice their content is no longer visible. You notice your podcasts are no longer visible to your normal size audience. So something is going on. The platform would be required as part of these guardrails, provide with an online mechanism so that you can dispute this enforcement action and ask the platform to stop doing that or to undo their action. Honestly, this is pretty much available today from most of the major platforms. There is a way to dispute and you can describe why you think they made a mistake. And most of the enforcement actions today are initially done by a computer algorithm. And when you make a dispute, what that normally triggers at Facebook or YouTube, or, you know, is that a human employee will look at the content and that employee will then render some decision. So in the case a platform looks at your content and refuses your request and they continue to block it or censor it or whatever they're doing, in that case, the user can now opt to appeal their dispute to AMRA. They would have to pay a nominal filing fee because, remember, we have to prevent frivolous appeals because we're talking about millions and millions of users posting every day and describe why they are appealing the enforcement action. And AMRA would have someone look at that and make some assessment whether AMRA should accept it. Should AMRA do an arbitration of this dispute? Uh, for example, if it's clearly child pornography, you know, Amr will probably say, sorry, this is just not something we're going to get involved with. Uh, the, the platform was correct, and here are the content rules that you broke. However, if Amr does accept the appeal, then it would be assigned to an arbitration judge um, through some process where random judges are offered, you know, to the user and, and to the platform. The platform would definitely want to participate because if they lose the arbitration, they will be facing serious material financial penalties, uh, the same way that FEMRA does that in, in the mm -hmm. finance industry. And the, and the arbitration would be conducted, you know, the user and the platform submit information. The judge may decide to set up a real-time Zoom call or Skype call to hear, you know, a debate about this, and then the, that arbitration judge would render a verdict based on whether the platform, remember the platform is certified, you know, by AMRA uh, and that whether they followed their already certified published content rules and they stayed within these four guardrails and then they can render a penalty or they might go the other way and tell the user, you know what, uh, they followed their rules, they're within the guardrails, your, your content uh, being blocked is acceptable. Hmm. So, um, What's, what's important is for AMRA to be able to handle the pressure of what the industry calls massive scale, because there's not only millions of users posting every day, but hmm. if you think about it, there are literally thousands or tens of thousands of new topics being posted sure. and created every day online. So scale is massive. So AMRA needs to have a way to only accept the appeals that are kind of not already very well dealt with through precedents, you know, but are new areas or, or interesting areas that need to be more clearly, you know, defined. And there needs to be a, a, a process to prevent frivolous, you know, appeals, some kind of nominal filing fee, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, all good points. I was thinking when you were talking, I wonder how many 
times right now, users appeal decisions that are made by algorithms and AI and bots, you know, just, I can't even yeah. tell how many times people I know are like, oh yeah, I got put in Facebook jail for three months. And it does beg the oh, question, sure. how, how large would this enforcement agency have to be? It's a really great proposal. Um, and it seems like the challenges to get that set up would definitely be worth the benefit that the, our free speech rights, our First Amendment rights would get from it. I love the Supreme Court language that you captured. Did you have anything else on mm -hmm. that? No, we've only got about a, a minute left uh, at this point anyway, so we'll, we'll probably need to wrap up here. But real quick, Mike, you're, you've been in Congress, reception, 30 seconds. What's it been like? It's, uh, as we, you know, it shouldn't be a partisan issue, but it has absolutely been a partisan issue. I have struggled and struggled to get um, Democrats to engage on this topic and, mm -hmm. and articulate to them that there is a risk in the future that they might feel put upon, you know, by censorship policies. Um, so generally, I focus on the Judiciary and Commerce Committees in the Senate and the House and the reception from Republicans is is quite good, except for you know, people are a little bit down because they just don't expect anything really can be done uh, while the Democrats are just not ready to engage on this topic. It, mm -hmm. It's almost like they just can't imagine the world might turn over if the White House changes parties or, you know, that things might just shift. Like a few decades ago, it was liberals who were getting censored uh, you know, by a more conservative, uh, you know, sort of a government establishment in the 1980s uh, at that time. So 